Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Uh, as we let folks trickle in, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Aliza Lustig. I'm on the National Climate Assessment Team at the U.S. Global Change Research Program. It is my um, very great pleasure to um, welcome you all to the Art by Climate webinar, which is the last in a series of webinars we've been doing around the release of the fifth National Climate Assessment. Um, we are joined today by three of the contributing artists to Art by Climate. We have Ian Van Coller, Laura Tanner, and Michael Snyder, um, who have all generously agreed to talk to us about their work and their contribution to the assessment. Um, I'm going to kick it off today with just some opening background before handing it over to them, and then we will get to Q&A at the end. Um, today, all mics are muted for participants, so if you are joining us and you have a question throughout the session, please feel free to put that into the chat. Um, and then I will also point you to the note that is in the chat, reminding you that all participants are expected to be respectful and considerate towards one another per the GCRP code of conduct. Um, if you have any questions about tech today, if you have any technical difficulties, please contact Aaron Grade, um, who will help with tech support today. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and get started um, with some background about Art by Climate. If you could, please go to the next slide. Okay, so to begin, some background about the U.S. Global Change Research Program. We are an interagency program under the White House um, comprised of 15 different agencies charged to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. Um, the same law were uh, uh, legally mandated by the Global Change Research Act of 1990. That same law also mandates the existence of the National Climate Assessment. Um, and so with that, you could go to the next slide. Um, some very, very brief overview of the report. So the NCA is mandated by that same act, like I said, to assess what we know about past and future climate changes and where the uncertainties remain. So what we don't know. Um, we are looking at observations up until the present, we're projecting out for the next 25 to 100 years, and we're looking specifically at eight different sector areas like transportation and human health and biodiversity, all of which are mandated as well by that act. The report is policy relevant, but always policy neutral, which is to say we are never recommending certain actions or advocating certain positions, we are reporting on the science. Um, the fifth National Climate Assessment, which came out in 2023, had 32 chapters, roughly 400 figures. Um, we had over 700 contributors from every state in the nation, plus um, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Palau, Micronesia, and Guam. Um, and we had over 8,000 references. So it is a very, very robust scientific document. Um, and you can find that here at the URL, nca2023.globalchange.gov. So that's kind of some background about the scientific assessment that we developed. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna move pretty quickly into Art by Climate, which is what we are all here to talk about today. This was the first ever call for visual art to be featured in the National Climate Assessment. This QR code will take you to our gallery. And um, I thought, you know, for the next few minutes, we'll go into some background about why we did this work and um, some of the response that we received to the project. Next slide. Okay, so first and foremost, why Art by Climate? Why did we take this on for the first time as a science program? First, the goal is to bring more people into the climate change conversation to expand the reach of that conversation, recognizing that you know a big scientific assessment like the NCA, which if you were to print it is something like 2000 pages long, is sort of alienating to a lot of people and that art can really help to bring more people in. Um, the next is to increase the resonance of the climate change conversation, which is to highlight the human side of this issue to engage emotion. Um, I've heard someone say once that if you think a lot, uh, that emotion is the gateway to memory. And if you think about some of your strongest emotions, uh, strongest memories, oftentimes they're emotional ones. And so that was also kind of a big driver behind some of this work is to really get the issue to sink in. And next, this is the first time we've ever done this. So we're really hoping to demonstrate the power of art to advance the climate change conversation. Now, a couple things to keep in mind, especially since we are a science program. 
The first is that art is not science communication, and that is really important in thinking about this. Um, art is its own form of knowing, of observing, of documenting, imagining, um, interpreting, and communicating. And so those two tenets really underpin a lot of um, the ethos behind the work we were trying to do here. Next slide. So this project started with Alison Crimmins, the NCA5 director, and she does send her regrets. She's sick today, but um, she was in large part the vision behind this project, if you would click. She mentioned that she wanted more art in the assessment, and that really got me thinking. Um, I have an informal arts background, and so was really taken with this idea um, and started to think in collaboration with agency colleagues about what this could look like. We had folks with us from, from NOAA, from NSF, from FEMA, from the Smithsonian Natural History Museum and the Portrait Gallery, all get together and brainstorm um, what ultimately became two calls for artwork. One was a call for youth work and one was a call for 18 and up work. And those calls circulated widely um, and the result was um, pretty astonishing. You know, we didn't really know what we would get seeing it's the first time doing this. Next slide, please. Um, we got over 800 submissions from across the country. They were vast in their coverage of topics and um, of media as used. We had a lot of work on wildfire, a lot on glaciers, and we worked with an expert jury um, from at the intersection of art and science to pair back from that body of 800 to the 92 pieces that are featured in the report. Next slide. Um, these two pieces were selected by our jury as some of the uh, as two of the top pieces in the collection. One is by Tammy West, and she um, stitched the earth um, to describe the urgency of the moment, um, feelings of futility, but also the potential to act um, in where we are right now. And then the second piece is here by Simona Klaus Nisser. She's talking about the impacts of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico um, in this triple layer lino cut. Next slide. We had three award winners from our youth category, and you see a piece here by Taylin um, who's based out in Idaho, talking about Western ecosystems, a centerpiece by Amelia, who's talking about um, the uncertainty of the future. Um, and um, you can kind of see themes of youth mental health in her work. And then a last piece by Ratika, who, whose piece really speaks to the agency of the moment. Next slide. In addition to submitting their work, um, artists also submitted artist statements. And here's an example of that. Please, if you go to the gallery, take a look at these statements. They lend a lot to the pieces. They help to explain what you may not take away just from looking at the work itself about the intention. Um, and they're just really, really powerful in, in their messaging. Next slide. Here are two examples of where data is integrated into the work. And I'm going to move quickly here because of time. But on the left, you have a piece by Jillian Pelto, who's talking about um, sea level rise, um, air, acreage of protected land and public opinion around environmental protection. And if you look closely, you can see a few data lines that are um, incorporated here into her watercolor and colored pencil piece. And on the right, you have a piece by Lorraine Woodruff Long, who's a San Francisco based artist talking about air quality um, in San Francisco uh, during the 2020 wildfire season. She stitched air quality data into a textile, which is really quite fascinating. Next. This is a piece that um, is kind of on the other end of the spectrum and that it doesn't involve data at all. It's really, um, this is a piece by Tammy Phelps up in Alaska. I love this piece um, as a landscape painter myself. Um, I know how much painting the landscape and depicting the landscape can connect you to place. <clears throat> and that's really what I take away from this is um, just the love for the place, some sadness around um, you know, the melting of the permafrost, but, but really connection to the landscape. Next slide. I think this is my final example of some of the work we received. This is my one of my favorite youth pieces by an artist named Maggie out in Cleveland, Ohio. She is depicting the uh, Cleveland skyline and I don't claim to know exactly what she is thinking because she is showing UFOs and flying cows and Godzilla. But I think what I love about this piece is the creativity that she brings to it and how incredibly out of the box she is here. And I just really, it's so inspiring to think in this way. And I, and I just believe that this kind of thinking is what is gonna help us meet the moment. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I think that's my last one. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to our artists starting with Ian Van Collar. Um, we'll be happy to take questions at the end about the process, about the collection, but first let's give it over to our artists. Thank you and over to you, Ian. Thanks, Aliza. 
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Ian Van Coller. I, uh, I, I'm out here in Bozeman, Montana, and I teach uh, photography at the university here. And actually, the last slide is by my very good friend and collaborator, Todd Anderson. So in 2012, um, sorry, I gotta start my timer so I don't go over time. Um, 2012, he invited me to go along with him and another friend of ours, Bruce Crownover, to hike into Glacier National Park in uh, Northern Montana to document as many of the remaining glaciers in the park as possible. Uh, we spent uh, three years and I think hiking maybe 500 to 600 miles over those uh, summers and we were able to reach 15 of the remaining 25 glaciers or so. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there were 135 glaciers in Glacier National Park. And now we're down to less than 20, depending on how you um, define what a glacier is. Many of them are now called um, ice fields or glacierettes. And what you're looking at here is one of the photographs I made in 2012. And at the top of the screen, you can see two small glaciers. On the right, right hand side is the Salamander Glacier, and the left side is Gem Glacier. Um, and this is uh, on the hike to Grinnell Lake, Grinnell Glacier, probably the most popular hike in uh, Glacier National Park. Maybe some of you have, have done that. Um, uh, next slide, please. So um, this is Sperry Glacier, also in Glacier National Park. And very quickly on in the project, I realized that I was drawn to the beauty of photographing um, glaciers and the ice in the landscape. And as an artist and not a scientist, I started to realize how much I didn't know about what I was photographing. And I, I, I also realized that, or thought about how when you make these pictures, make these photographs, there's a lot of limit to what photography can do or tell us in, ter in terms of a visual language. And at some point I thought, well, are, why are these not just another photograph of another sad melting glacier and that we can't do anything about it? And, you know, what next? What other information can I convey about what's going on. So this is an important uh, photograph from that project because of the object on the left-hand side. Uh, it's an automated weather station um, that a scientist has put there to gather data. And uh, soon after making this photograph, I thought I wanted to learn about um, what the scientists were doing and about what I did not know myself um, as an artist. Uh, next slide, please. So in uh, 2015, um, while trying to research different glaciers around uh, the world that I wanted to photograph, I made contact uh, with this scientist, uh, Douglas Hardy, who um, is at University of Massachusetts. I, I found one of his photographs of Kilimanjaro glaciers. And I, being from South Africa, um, Kilimanjaro is kind of this iconic image in my head. And I just emailed him, um, I, asking him if he might allow me to accompany him on an expedition at some point. And he emailed me back right away and said, um, actually, I, I did my graduate work at Montana State University, and you can join me whenever you want, um, as long as you can you know, secure your own funding. So literally within a couple of months, I was on my way to Peru with him and a, a large team of glacier scientists um, to Kalkaya Glacier, which is this large ice cap um, south of Cusco. And over a period of a decade, um, Doug had been constructing this uh, automated weather station to collect data. Each year he would go down there and he would add pieces to uh, this incredible uh, modernist sculpture. I mean, it's just this, this thing of beauty. And 
um, I made photographs with him and his team while I was down there. And then uh, when I returned home, uh, after discussion with the scientists, I um, made a large print. These are This one is about 30 by 40 inches. I shipped it across the country to him. We had conversations about it. And thinking about um, ideas related to uh, climate change, uh, paleoclimatology, uh, things that record Earth's past climate, his own research, what he's trying to figure out. I asked him to interpret the photograph um, in a way that made sense to him, but would allow um, viewers to, to enter his research, enter that space uh, beyond just the photograph itself. Next slide, please. So what I've, in this whole series that I've been doing, and now I've, I've collaborated with a whole bunch of artists, I've been doing this work for over a decade now, and um, what I find fascinating is the idiosyncrasies of uh, each of the scientists. And I, part of the purpose of doing this work is I wanna make, I wanna allow scientists to become artists again, because in the past, in the Victorian era, um, the training of science, scientists was very different. Um, it was much more broad. Um, scientists learned poetry and they learned to draw and they learned a wide variety of skills. And I think today um, it's much more narrow and it's also very difficult for the general public to enter the research um, because it's so esoteric. And uh, you know, I've read a lot of climate um, papers, science papers, and it's very hard to understand a lot of the, the jargon. And so um, through this combination of art and science, I hope to help scientists bring the work to a, a different audience, a larger audience, help them become artists again, explore their own creativity, and um, help me uh, you know, try to understand what it is I'm actually photographing. So yeah, one thing to, to pay attention to is a couple of different slides is um, how very precise Doug is. Each little thing is very carefully labeled, um, connecting to um, the weather station. Uh, and, you know, an A says, Kalkaya ice cap is the largest typical glacier on Earth uh, in the Cordillera, sorry, uh, not typical, tropical um, glacier on Earth in the Cordillera Vilcanota uh, of Peru at 13.9 degrees south, 70.8 degrees west. The ice cap is currently 40 km. 40 kilometers squared in area, declining at a rate of about 1% per year. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a friend of mine, Karsten Brown. He's become a friend from that expedition. Um, and his approach is sort of, is much more didactic, but also narrative, um, also painterly. His, his wife is actually an artist. And so they kind of discuss the, the, the collaborations together. And you can see the, the difference between his um, illustrations compared to Doug's, um, which are much more precise. Um, I've since 2015, I have now collaborated with Karsten on an expedition to Uganda. And then last year we were in the Wind Rivers of uh, Wyoming together. So um, I, I've, through this process, I've made really good friends. I've learned a whole lot. And so really it's a fascinating process. Next slide. Um, so I'm actually going to move on to the next slide, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> so this is the piece that was um, in the online exhibition. Um, I've collaborated with a lot of uh, scientists um, at my own institution, Montana State University. Uh, this is uh, Pamela Santibenez Avila. Uh, at the time I made this photograph, she was a um, PhD student. and um, I photographed her through glass. I was not allowed inside this. This is a level one clean lab. This is a, a piece of ice from Antarctica, um, which she has cut, and then she's going to melt to extract um, various uh, things that she wanted to study. Um, and it was just a pleasure to, to uh, collaborate with her. She was so enthusiastic, uh, so engaged with the whole process. Next slide, please. And you can see from um, the preciseness and 
um, there are beautiful illustrations. There are kind of information that you can gain. So this particular piece of ice is uh, 10,833 years old. It tells the depth of it. She's drawing little viruses, bacteria, and pollen. That's what she's really interested in finding. So when she melts this, she's trying to uh, extract the DNA um, and learn about things that have blown from the African continent and the South American continent on, onto Antarctica um, to learn about um, various things about weather and climate at that particular time. Uh, next slide. So the important things are um, in terms of ice and what I've been really interested in is she, as she describes, ice cores are recorders of climate variability. Ice cores are unique because we can obtain direct measures of past atmosphere composition. So 10% approximately um, of um, a glacier is air that was trapped at that specific time that the glacier was formed. So um, it's an exact archive of our past climate. Back now, um, we have ice from Antarctica and the Allen Hills uh, on an expedition I was on in 2018, sorry, 2019, that is now three to four million years old. So we have a, we have a way to look back way into the past and look at um, what the climate was doing. Um, the information archived in ice cores is derived from different components such as chemical um, species, insoluble particle, particles, isotopes um, for the water molecule and gases for air bubbles. Um, I've gone over my time and I still had more slides, but um, I'm gonna pass it on to the next person. All right, thanks, Ian. I'm sorry to cut you off early. That was so interesting. Um, so um, my name is Laura Tanner. I am an assistant professor at Florida Atlantic University. Um, I teach uh, research methodologies and interdisciplinary studio practice here. Um, so today I am gonna tell you about an ongoing project that I've been working on called DISH. Um, that uses drawing and social practice and the tradition of storytelling to facilitate ongoing research into the correlation between local foodways and issues of um, social and climate justice. Next slide, please. Um, so trying to locate the intersections between climate and social justice has always been at the center of my research. Um, I started incorporating food ways into this research around 2021, um, beginning with the American South, in part because I'm from that region. I'm from um, Georgia, um, and I'm therefore familiar with the cultural tendencies and regional challenges, but it's also because this is a really complex um, and dynamic region, and this um, complexity is often reflected in uh, the food there. So, um, this, this region has always been in flux, right, with the arrival of diverse uh, migrant communities um, that have been displaced by climatic as well as social changes. Um, so the cultural ingredients and rituals make the journey with these migrant communities to these new locations to slowly modify um, the traditional dishes of their adopted home. Um, there's also new agricultural challenges um, that result from a rapidly changing climate, forcing substitutions for traditional ingredients um, that are no longer readily available. And then there's of course, changing public policy that affects access to nutrition, um, resulting in lasting consequences to health and well being of entire communities. Um, next slide, please. So these are some details from the image before. Um, so I'm going to give you a little history on the project first, and then um, I'll kind of walk into how this um, is related to climate change and how I'm thinking about that specifically. Um, so when thinking about those issues of um, justice, both climate and social, I wanted to explore the question of who prepares the food and who sits at the table. So I began organizing community events, usually in the form of shared meals or recipe exchanges, when um, or where local residents could 
um, share stories about the preparation and presentation of classic regional recipes and food traditions related to the gathering table. Um, so from this exchange, I usually archive the recipes and stories and family photographs um, shared in a series of drawings and printed catalogs, um, as well as an online archive. Um, so the catalog is meant to kind of take the form of a junior league cookbook or community cookbook referencing the um, the inherent activism of those similar um, community efforts by extending the conversation beyond um, the shared meal or community event and raising awareness about local challenges. Next slide, please. Um, so the first iteration of this project took place in Springfield, Ohio, as a part of um, a solo exhibition that I had at the Springfield Art Museum. Um, and so this particular project explored the evolution of regional recipes and food traditions as they were impacted by periods of significant population shifts in Springfield. Um, so, for example, between 1910 and 1970, the social fabric was changed, um, like many other northern cities, due to um, the Great Migration, um, when many millions of African Americans moved from the rural South to um, Northern and Midwestern cities. And with them, new cultural traditions, um, celebrations, and recipes migrated to these locations. Um, Springfield's located approximately like 80 miles or so Northeast of Cincinnati. Um, so it, of course, experienced this um, this significant shift in its um, social makeup as well. Um, so this affected their customs, cuisine, everything. Um, next slide, please. So as part of the exhibition in Ohio, I organized a community recipe exchange um, where they could, where the community could um, exchange a written recipe or food stories. Um, the recipes varied. Some were handed down through generations from one family member to another. Some were shared by friends um, and others were just things that people had developed on their own. Um, if people decided to share a story in lieu of a recipe, um, they I asked them to respond to one of the following kind of prompts. Um, I usually ask something along the lines of what is your relationship to Springfield and how has it changed throughout your life? Um, I asked them to describe their life and or family history in the area um, to describe what they think, what they would characterize as the regional food. Um, I asked them who sits at their table. Um, so questions like that. Um, and so from this exchange um, or in exchange, excuse me, from the recipe or story that was shared, I offered a custom designed plate that um, future meals could be made and served on um, that were made from the catalog. And so the drawing in the center um, that was printed in the center acknowledged the history of the Great Migration and its influence on Ohio's changing identity, specifically the meat and three moving from that agricultural tradition of the South um, and into the Midwestern um, kind of um, urban center. So um, with each iteration of this project, I've noticed interesting trends. Um, for example, in Ohio, many of the stories shared were referencing public policy and immigration. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of one of the pages in the catalog. Um, I'll just read it quickly. Uh, my grandma Ray says from Russia and survived through World War II. Of course, even when the war was over, the life was not easy for many people. Hunger took a toll on many people. I was told stories of my grandma eating grass and whatever she could find at these times. People used to boil wallpaper to make uh, hot water thicker on the stomach. Potatoes became a big staple food in my family. I spent many years cooking with grandma while hearing her stories. Many were so heartbreaking. She is, uh, she is a, an inspiring and brave woman in my life. Most foods we cooked contained potatoes, dumplings, potato pancakes, and mashed potatoes, which were my absolute favorite. Boil potatoes, use hot, uh, only hot milk, butter, and salt. Simple. All right, next slide, please. Um, so I also learned while in Ohio about um, its history as an agricultural center. It produced most of the agricultural machinery in the United, United States from the Civil War to the 1950s. And then as our, um, our, as our kind of uh, 
economy moved away from those blue collar industry type jobs in the late 20th and early 21st century. This changed the economic makeup of Ohio and experienced um, significant declines in median e income. Um, the most significant decline actually in the United States in a five-year period ever, which was 27%. So there's a lot of um, organizations they are working with those who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, and those were the organizations that I worked very closely with, and they were the main contributors to the catalog people that they were working with. Um, so that included um, food banks, uh, organizations that were advocacy programs for families um, and uh, children. So um, they were, again, they were the majority contributors to this catalog. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the current iterations of this project um, are, in, are occurring in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, South Florida, and New Orleans. And all three of these locations are coastal communities that are already feeling the impacts of climate change. Um, these are all areas with economies that are heavily dependent upon the fishing industry and tourism. Um, but both um, of these economic drivers are under threat due to unprecedented saltwater intrusion um, into the local estuaries and violent storm systems that are growing ever more frequent and ravaging the coastlines. Um, the oral histories archived within each iteration of DISH acknowledge the local challenges that are also national challenges and that obstacles afflicting one community really affect us all. Next slide, please. Um, so the following drawings that you'll see are all um, forms of, um, or excuse me, my interpretations of stories um, and recipes that I've collected within these communities. This one responds directly to South Florida. Um, everything is hand drawn and hand cut. Um, next slide, please. Um, this piece here, um, is also about uh, New Orleans um, and the, um, the the raising of the homes, the raising of everything, you know, to try to um, prepare for those inevitable rising waters that are coming. Um, next slide, please. Just a quick detail of those. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna move on quickly to the next slide. Um, so through um, this engagement with the local residents, the documentation of personal narratives and the subsequent growing or sharing of the growing archive in various locations across the country, um, my hope is that the connections between our communities and the challenges that we are facing become for, uh, forefronted. Um, I'm also working on a moving image slash film kind of iteration of this project to go along with um, the drawings and the catalog as just another way of sharing these stories. Um, and my hope is that um, while listening to or reading the oral histories of one um, community, like those living in New Orleans, um, maybe residents in Portsmouth, New Hampshire will hear echoes of their own experience. Um, so I don't know. Uh, Elisa, do we have time for a one minute audio? Okay. So is that yeah, area there. of the city yeah. is considered when you ask other people in the city, like, oh, it's so country down there. <laughs> they they might even say, like they they just dirty down there. Like they just think you're close. Because we weren't close to the 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 downtown area, right? So it was almost like we have our own because we separated by water from the rest of the city. Sometimes you could even say it was forgotten by the city, like <laughs> some of the municipalities or the services, like it just, it wasn't developing that, that man. Like my grandmother used to have pigs, chickens, turtles, and all this stuff in the yard, and they would eat them, you know. And then the city came and stopped that, shut all that down with ordinances and stuff like that. So then you had to start going to the store because you couldn't, because you could find and you get and you're getting a lesser quality and you're spending more and you didn't have the money for it and you're also forgetting the skill set and all that stuff. But I started it off with the, those people of the country okay. down there because- That's it, you can stop it. Um, thank you, Izzy. Uh, so next slide, please. When I was a kid, I'm... that area- 
Um, so that was an example of some of the audio recordings that I've been working with. That was Fred Johnson in New Orleans sharing um, his experience growing up in uh, the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, so uh, just to end this uh, project here that I've talked about, um, the stories that are included in this project dish recognize the intersection between our regional foodways and how they might be emblematic of the tightly woven social and systemic fabrics that bind us while the multidisciplinary kind of presentation that I'm working with hopefully offers um, a pathway to engage in creative action. That's the idea behind the project. So um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Snyder. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of visual communications at Syracuse University's Newhouse School, and I'm a photographer and filmmaker, and, and most of my work focuses on environmental and uh, social justice stories, both. Uh, you can reach me if you get any questions afterwards I'm on Instagram at, at Michael O. Snyder, or also you can shoot me an email at Michael O. Snyder at gmail.com. Uh, so, so the body work I'm going to be showing you today is called The Coming Coast, and it's focused on making the often invisible problem of sea level rise visible. Uh, and I say invisible because like many climate related problems, it's happening at a rate that's actually quite slow, at least um, from a human perspective of time. Um, but from a geologic perspective, it's happening very fast. Uh, currently, sea level rise is about three millimeters per year on, on global average, which, which is a lot, actually. Uh, but hard to see on a on a year to year basis. And as a species, we're hardwired to attend to immediate threats uh, like a fire or a tiger entering the camp. So, as storytellers and um, and educators, how how do we tell stories and get the public engaged about a threat like sea level rise uh, or or climate change more broadly, which is a slow boiling pot? Um, and and that's the driving question that underlined this body of work. I'm, I'm actually gonna have you back up some slides um, if you can. Yeah, that's that's great. One one forward, and you should be in the right spots. Yep, right there. Okay, great. So I just want to start by getting you centered uh, geographically and visually on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is the one of the world's great geographies, and it's where this this project takes place. So the the bay is about a hundred miles end to end, a, a little bit more, but it's got eleven thousand miles of coastline, which makes it the largest estuary in North America and the third largest on the planet. So it's this incredibly large. Uh, flat marshy area, which is extremely biologically rich and includes critical habitat for thousands of species, uh, many of which are endemic. Yep. And then next slide. And it's also home to about 18 million people and growing. Uh, that includes the nation's capital, uh, several major urban centers, the U.S. naval fleet. Um, indigenous peoples have been here for over 10,000 years, and this was actually the area that was the landing point for the first English-speaking settlers. Next slide. So the bay is very low-lying and marshy. You can actually walk through about 700,000 acres of water without fully going underwater. And because of this feature, uh, this area has been an incredibly rich producer of seafood uh, and was once uh, the most productive oyster habitat on the planet, which is worth uh, billions of dollars. There's still a little bit of this today, but a, a fraction of, of what it once was. Next slide. So all of these things, the, the, the low-lying nature, the critical habitat, the number of people, the amount of infrastructure, th this makes the bay especially vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, along with the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, this is probably really ground zero in North America with tens of thousands of acres lost and potentially thousands of climate migrants by the year 2100. Next slide. So in, in doing work on sea level rise over the years, my, my core observation, again, has been that while sea level rise is omnipresent, it's actually invisible in a lot of ways on a day-to-day -day basis. So for this project, The Coming Coast, I took four approaches to get after that, making it more visible. I've got a data-based approach, an art-based approach, a tech-based approach, and a narrative-based approach that all kind of weave together. So I, I'm going to walk you through some of those uh, results and then talk just a little bit about them. All right, next slide. So first, um, I spent several months uh, crunching publicly available data and mapping two scenarios that show visually what we stand to lose in the Bay by the year 2100. And the, the dark blues, uh, so on, on the left here is what the Bay looks like today. Uh, on the right in the dark blue area, that's scenario one, that's what we stand to lose by year 2100 if we make deep and rapid cuts now. That's not just in the US, but also globally. 
And the light blue area, which you can just see on the edge, that's the additional land that will be lost if we do nothing now, right? So that's kind of the, the range of outcomes. Um, yep, stay on that slide just for a sec. So the first jaw drop of the project is just how committed we are already to sea level rise, right? Everything in dark blue is, is very likely to go. Um, and, and light blue is kind of the area that we, we think we can save. So unless there's some sort of technological black swan, the amount of loss, at least for this geography, is going to be immense. Next slide. Next, um, using that data, I took an art-based approach. So for about a month, I lived out of the back of my car. This is in 20, uh, 2021 during the pandemic. And I traveled around the length of the bay in a counterclockwise uh, fashion. And all along the way, I took this thick blue painter's tape and I marked places where the coastline uh, is going to be uh, sometime between now and the year 2100. And, and the goal really here was to get people to see that there are areas that may look very dry today, but they're probably not going to be in a very short amount of time. So I'll just give you a few examples here of what that looks like. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Then you can hold here. Um, and and then over the years, I've learned that that drones are a really great way to show sea level rise. It's hard to see from below. Um, and so um, what I did is I took drone photos of four communities around the Chesapeake Bay and using those, uh, the maps and the data that I had earlier, I showed what six feet of sea level rise would look like um, in, in, in the year 2100, which is roughly what we're on course for. Uh, and an important point to make here is that even though some of the land is above water here, a lot of that will be uninhabitable anyway, because being so close to the water, it's going to be hit with increasingly powerful storms uh, and have infrastructure impacts as well. And at the same time, if we don't allow wetlands to migrate inland, they will probably be, be lost as well. This last photo you're looking at here was, is the most impacted of, of the sites that I was working at. Okay, and then next slide. Okay, and finally, and for me, this is really the, the bulk of the work and also kind of the, the beating heart of the project. Um, I used networks that I had established over the years of working on sea level rise in the, in the bay and, and, and growing up and living not very far away to find 31 individuals from all around the Chesapeake Bay. And the, group, the, the, the goal was to get as diverse a group as possible. So ethnicities, genders, identities, vocations, beliefs, uh, education, family history, socioeconomic status, really try to cast a broad net. But what they had to have were two things in common. Um, one, they had to be directly impacted by in some way by sea level rise. And two, they had to believe that sea level rise is an important issue, that it's, it's worthy of our concern and our work. So for each of these individuals, I photographed, photographed them along with a depth stick, again, showing what six feet of sea level rise would look like for a place that they loved. And then I conducted uh, a one to three hour interview asking them these three questions. One, what's happening right now where you live? Two, why do you care about this? Like what, what values in you are activated by caring about this? And three, and really importantly, what can be done you know, on all levels and what is being done? What solutions are you engaging with? So again, I'll show you a few of those images uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Next slide. And you can keep clicking through here, yeah. Great. Yeah. And you can stop here. So as I said, for each of these individuals, I conducted these interviews and then I reduced them down to uh, approximately like an 800 word essay per, per person. Um, and I did that for each of them. And this is just an example here. There's no time here to, to read into it, but just to give you a sense for what it looks like. Um, this is one that I really liked and, and, and really touched me. And if you are interested in seeing more of what the people on the ground said, and again, to me, this is really where it's at because I I sit in my chair, I've got my camera, but these are people that are living this, that are truly on the front lines of, of, of climate change and are really thinking about how we can build broader, more inclusive, more robust communities and networks. Um, I think to me, this is the most powerful part of it. Um, you can go to, to BuzzFeed News uh, and, and Google this. That's the uh, place that published this first. And, and they carried a lot of these transcripts um, in full. Uh, next slide, please. You can go to the next slide. Well, while that's uh, waiting to come up, um, uh, 
I'll just I'll, I'll give you a sense for it anyway. So 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 this project uh, came out in in magazines in uh, late 2021, and I've spent um, quite a bit of time since trying to build impact around the work. Right, we can make the work, but then the question is, what what work does that work do in the world? So I've been traveling uh, and speaking about the work quite a bit. I'm using the work to host community dialogues. We've done indoor and outdoor installations uh, and really try to bring people together around this, to have conversations around this, people in the project, um, people also outside of it. Um, and uh, we've been we're trying to seed this work in public schools, um, community organizers using the work now. And, and because this model, like the work itself is relatively easy to do, um, to shoot these portraits, paint the lines, it's something that I'm, I'm proud to say is happening. Um, I think there are five schools now that have used this model um, for students to work on and teach with. And I'm talking to various government agencies um, and nonprofit organizations about how they might be able to use something like this too. Um, so all, all of that said, I think there's a lot more here we could say about you know how we tell stories that better communicate science and drive uh, social impact. But I, I believe that's my time. So I will wrap up here for now.